Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm Mary Texera. I'm uh, uh, Professor Emerita uh, at Cal State San Bernardino in the Department of Sociology. And as you might guess, we are very, very excited um, to hear from our guest today, Congressman Jamal Bowman from uh, the 16th District of uh, the Congressional District in, uh, in New York. Uh, but first, I would like to um, offer a land acknowledgement, Congressman Bowman, which is something that we do every every week. Um, you represent, I think, our 97th or 98th guest. Uh, we've been doing this for quite a while uh, in the uh, after the death of George Floyd. So with that, I will um, just say that we recognize that California State University, San Bernardino, sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, Yuhaviatam Serrano. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous people. Uh, so with that, I will turn the program over to uh, Matt Patino, who uh, it's because of Matt that that we are uh, able to do this today. So take it away, Matt. Thank you. Uh, Representative Jamal Bowman, EDD. He was first elected to Congress in 2020 and reelected in 2022 to represent New York's 16th district. Congressman Bowman was born and raised in New York City, spending his early years in public housing and in rent control departments. He went on to receive a BA in sports management from the University of New Haven and then began his career as a crisis intervention teacher in Brooklyn, excuse me, in Bronx public schools. Uh, Congressman Bowman earned his MA in guidance counseling from Mercy College and his doctorate in education from Manhattanville College. In 2009, he founded CASA, Cornerstone Academy for Social Action, a Bronx middle school that is focused on unlocking the natural brilliance of all children through a holistic curriculum. There, he served as principal for a decade. Um, now, Representative Bowman sits on the House Committee on Education and Labor and the Civil Rights and Human Services Subcommittee. Social justice is one of the congressman's primary concerns, and he has been an advocate and has urged the Biden administration to end the school-to-prison pipeline, which is what you're here to discuss today. Correct, Congressman? Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. Should I just jump in? Jump right on, right on in. Yeah. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. Uh, thank you so much for having me and allowing me to share a few words. I apologize uh, deeply for being late. Uh, my flight was delayed and I had to rush here to the office right after the flight. As you can see, I'm not even in a suit. I'm in my travel gear. But, you know, we're all ride or die, so I'm sure you can you can understand and appreciate that. Um, shout out to Brooklyn, but I absolutely spent most of my education career in the Bronx. I don't want no smoke with the Bronx, man. I got to go back home, and I don't want no drama with the Bronx. So, but I love Brooklyn. Shout out to Brooklyn. Um, so thank you for having me. Thank you for the work that you are doing. Thank you for continuing to organize on this particular issue. As you know, we need a revolution within our criminal justice system, period, point blank. It is inhumane, it is racist, it is operating exactly as it was designed to be operating, and it is something that has been nurtured and funded historically by not just Republicans, Democrats as well. So the school to prison pipeline is what I'm going to spend most of my time uh, discussing this evening. But as you know, our prison industrial complex is connected to much more than that. It's connected to stop and frisk. 
It's connected to just being able to pull someone over on the highway without real just cause. It's connected to the lack of affordable housing in our communities. It's connected to food insecurity. It's connected to the lack of workforce development in our communities. It's connected to mental health. It's connected to miseducation. And it's connected to substance abuse, among many other things. We all know this. And as I just, as I said at the beginning, this has been nurtured and facilitated by Republicans and Democrats historically. So the work that you are all, you all are doing, the work that I'm doing, the work that so many are trying to do across this country is part of that resolution to bring humanity back to our society. We always brag about the wealth that we have and our military might. But despite that wealth, we still incarcerate more people than anywhere else in the world. And most of them are African-American or Latino, disproportionately African-American, as we all know. If you're African-American, if you're African-American male, you're more likely to die at the hands of police. So this is about policing. This is about prosecutors. This is about judges. And this is about jails and prisons, as we all know. And the more you read about this issue, you know, Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow, the more you realize how insidious it is. And the more you learn and realize that this is not a new thing. This was written in the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery, except in prison. So this is all by design, as we know. And one other insidious part of it that I always have to mention is the issue of disenfranchisement. You know what's crazy? When, when, if someone you know, commits a crime or does harm in their community and they're held accountable for that, why do they lose the right to vote too? And why does that right continue to be taken away when they come home in many places across the country? So the issue of probation, the issue of parole, the issue of disenfranchisement, the issue of racism, the issue of American history and ideology and the American paradigm, this is all connected to all of that. But in our schools, in our schools, I've seen it manifested over my 20 years in education, first at the elementary level, then at the high school level, then at the middle school level. The number one thing so-called leaders talk about as it relates to education reform. It's charter schools, but then it's also putting more school resource officers or police in our schools. But it's not just the presence of police in our schools that's the issue. It's the fact that educators, teachers, and school administrators, when there is a behavioral challenge, if you will, in the school, they don't deal with it themselves many times with their training. They call on the police or school resource officer to do so, which escalates the situation and leads to so much of the harm we see taking place uh, in our schools. That's one aspect of the school to prison pipeline. The other aspect is the disproportionate number of Black and Latino students that are placed in special education classes usually in schools that are under-resourced and underfunded. Now, when a child uh, has some challenges as it relates to learning, or if a child learns differently or non-traditionally, many schools, because they don't have the resources, don't know how to go after um, really understanding what's going on with that particular child so that they can help that particular child in a uh, least restrictive environment, which is a general education classroom. So oftentimes, because they don't have the resources, they expedite the evaluation process, which leads to the child being placed in special ed, which then leads to the child not receiving the education that they deserve. It leads to frustration, it leads to stress, it leads to trauma, which then leads to behavior problems that manifest in schools all across the country. And the behavior challenges don't only happen in special education, they happen in general education as well. And another major aspect of the school to prison pipeline, as you all know, is when we when we discard kids for, for quote unquote misbehaving. We discard them in a couple of ways. One, through detention, you know, punitive measure. Two, through suspension, in school suspensions in New York, Three, through out-of-school suspensions where we send them home, 
but even for before the stigma that's attached to all of that and how we treat kids once they're done, you know, being punished for the harm that they committed. When I was a principal and even throughout my time as a dean and even as a teacher, we implemented something called restorative justice. And this is something that needs to be implemented all throughout, uh, not just the school system, but also our carceral system. Restorative justice is about ensuring that the child remains connected to the community after they have committed a harm, but also it's a mediation process and conversation process so that the child can understand what they did wrong and how that harmed the community. They hear from teachers, they hear from parents, they hear from admin, they hear from other kids, and they're able to voice their own uh, confusion or frustration or discomfort. And with this round dialogue, if you will, the child then is less likely to commit harm as it relates to the school community going forward. In my 10 years as principal, we worked very hard to implement restorative justice in our school. And I could count on one hand, maybe a little more than one hand in 10 years, how many fights we had in my school. Because the school wasn't just a school, it was a community. And we weren't just students and staff, we were family. And because it was a community and we were family, we held ourselves responsible and accountable for what happened in that school. And if we committed harm to one another or to the school building itself, we talked about that publicly. One of the ways we talked about it was through an assembly every Friday called Community Circle. And Community Circle was like, you know, just to go back to the, the indigenous recognition that was shared at the beginning of this call, it's like a powwow, it's a celebration of the school community. And during the celebration, kids would give each other shout outs, teachers would give each other and kids shout outs to acknowledge something good that they did for, for, for a peer during the week, but they would also make public apologies, publicly acknowledging the harm that was committed during the week. And this is all about community support as someone is holding themselves accountable. And this was another powerful tool that helped our school to get away from the dismissal and marginalization of kids and bring them more into the school community. We also did not simply implement a traditional education system. You know why? It's boring. Learning can be challenging and fun at the same time. And it could be hands-on and it could be creative and it could be project-based. The top-down method of teacher giving information to student, student regurgitating it back to teachers while they sit in rows and listen like, uh, like they're in an assembly line in a school building, that's boring, that is old school, that is something that leads to, leads to challenges as well. And so our curriculum was project-based. It wasn't just science, it was STEM education. It wasn't just English and social studies, it was humanities. We implemented Socratic seminars. We had computer science in our school. We had theater, we had horticulture. We had sports, we had arts, we had everything to develop our kids holistically, holistically. And because you tapped into their, their social, emotional, cognitive, physical, and psychological learning, they were vibrant within our learning environment and happy to be there as opposed to traditional settings. That all helped us to stem the tide away from the school to prison pipeline or school to prison nexus, as some people call it. The last thing I wanna mention is this. The, the, one of the most important, if not the most important aspect of responding to the crisis of the school to prison pipeline involves dealing with the impact of toxic stress and chronic trauma on the lives of our kids, on the lives of uh, our families, and on their brain development. And some of you may know this research. First of all, I know you all know, 
the majority of the people who are incarcerated, I forget the percentage, but the vast majority, have been identified as having a learning disability, mental health disorder, substance abuse disorder, um, or some other form of trauma in their lives. I know you all know that, that research and data. I focus a lot on early childhood education in my work because the brain develops rapidly between conception and age three. And if that child, as it's developing, goes through toxic stress and chronic trauma during that time, the brain doesn't develop the higher order thinking skills necessary to do well in a, in a K-12 school setting. As a result of that, you see kids who come from trauma not only uh, start kindergarten behind academically, their peers, but also are more likely to be referred to special education and more likely to suffer from a mental health uh, disorder or substance abuse disorder. They're also more likely to have negative economic and health outcomes as adults. Many of you may be familiar with the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experiences, that was done in, in the medical field many years ago. It applies to education here as well. And that's why the focus on early childhood education is so critical, just to make sure we have quality, healthy, nurturing childcare for every family, as well as quality, healthy, nurturing 3K and pre-K and Head Start programs for families as well. So as we tackle this challenge and and deal with the uh, part of the uh, decarceration revolution that we need that involves the school system, we have to look at it from birth to careers and make sure we're implementing what's necessary that needs to be implemented there. So, so thank you so much for allowing me to say a few words and thank you for having me. Thank you again for the work that you all do and uh, look forward to partnering with you uh, going forward, because it's not just a one-off conversation. We got a lot of work to do. Thank you, Congressman. Are you available for a couple of questions? Yes. Great. Um, I have uh, actually a couple. I I took the opportunity to uh, read uh, an article that you submitted to the Washington Post, and um, I also read through your dissertation. So the question I have kind of wow. comes from both places. Thank you. I feel, I feel honored. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the Washington Post piece, you advocated teaching BIPOC history and culture. Um, and in your dissertation, you talked about attracting more diverse uh, faculty. Um, so both of these questions uh, come back to what your position is now in the federal government. Um, so two parts. What should the federal government do to help override the states, individual states that are implementing anti-CRT laws? And then with that, um, what can the federal government to do to uh, also um, uh, help curb those efforts to do away with uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, both of which, uh, from what I got from your writing, are part of the systemic racism that you mentioned at the beginning? No, absolutely. So I think the federal government should incentivize the implementation of DEI in states and school districts across the country. Give states money to do more DEI. Give school districts money to do more DEI. And by doing more DEI, we mean a culturally responsive curriculum that's rooted in BIPOC history, right, and culture, mm -hmm. and the diversity of the human experience. That's what that means. But it also means recruiting diverse uh, teachers into the classroom, um, which is, uh, a priority of mine because as a black male teacher, I was one of only, I was like part of 2% of teachers nationwide. That number might have gone down uh, since COVID. And I knew my responsibility wasn't just uh, as an educator, I knew it was as a mentor, a role model, a father figure, because I grew up also without my father being present in the home. And I know how being around um, adult males. Um, I know how that impacted me as a kid, adult men of color, uh, when I would be around them. And so to have them in classrooms with our kids uh, it, it is vital. And it's not just vital for, for uh, Black kids to, to have Black teachers. It's vital for all kids to have diverse teachers, because what happens is, as you all know, our communities are so segregated, historically segregated. We are so uneducated and dare I say incompetent as it relates to other people, people from other backgrounds, 
So we don't know each other's history and culture and 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 religions and backgrounds and the foods they eat and 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 where they come. We don't know that about each other. And as a result, we see these historic fights across race and ethnicity and background because of that lack of knowledge. So it's it's absolutely key for kids to see themselves as teachers in the classroom. I was very lucky when I was in uh, junior high school. I had. Mr. Harrell and Mr. Allred, Allridge, I know them both. I remember them clearly. I don't remember all my teachers. I remember them. And and Mr. Allridge, I stay in, I stay in touch with him now. I have his number in my phone, um, and I text him every now and then. And so that that is that is vital. And I think the federal government can incentivize uh, by giving more resources for school districts to do this. Having said that, um, because of because of segregation. Um, there's a lot of racism baked into local school districts. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of school districts that don't care how much money you give them. They are not going to change things up for their particular district. And so it's going to take um, conversations at the local level also um, and grassroots organizing so that we can get the right people involved in certain school districts to change their direction as it relates to DEI and, and so-called CRT. So that brings me to my next question. Um, you mentioned taking a holistic approach at CASA, um, and you also uh, mentioned in, and I'm not sure if it was from the article or from your dissertation, social emotional learning curriculum. And you spread that out to include music and the arts yeah. and the proponents of No Child Left Behind have always fought spending money um, on things that are considered frivolous. So how do you respond to those critics? Uh, they don't know education um, or they don't understand, no disrespect, they don't understand <laughs> um, what education is all about. And I mean, from the root word, I mean, to, to, to pull out, to, to extract what is within. And if, and if that's our job to do that, what's inside of children is their unlimited potential. We're talking about the indwelling, infinite, intuitive intelligence. And so think about how you feel when you, um, when you, when you hear a song that you like, for example. Um, think about how you feel when you, when you observe a beautiful piece of art. Think about how you feel when you're working with your hands. Think about how you feel when you're playing a sport. Now, um, you know, both from an observation perspective, but also in a participation perspective. The thing that gives you goosebumps are these things that I'm talking about, right? The, the holistic curriculum. These are the things that give you goosebumps as you learn. And, and when you find the thing that you're good at, your self-esteem and self-worth goes through the roof, through the roof. And, you know, I, I was a big fan. I've always been a big fan of Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences. And one of the intelligences is bodily kinesthetic intelligence. And so, um, you know, dance, movement, performance, theater, that's all part of learning as well. There are kids who thrive in that, but can't get above a level two on the standardized tests. And so we're supposed to deprive them of what they're great at just to make them sit there and make sure they bubble in the right answer on the test. There are well-documented stories of grandmasters in chess at 14 years old who have traveled all over the world as chess grandmasters, but can't pass one of these standardized tests. Mm -hmm. So you don't take away one for the other. You, you provide a, a, a wide interdisciplinary curriculum so that every kid can find what they're good at and then give them, allow them to, to, to exercise that pathway as they as they thrive in that particular thing. And, and everything I'm saying is not my theory. This is mm -hmm. research. This is right. well documented. Right. You can easily look this up. Right. Thank you so much, Congressman. I'm going to uh, turn over our last question to uh, representing Brooklyn, <laughs> our <laughs> Professor Emerita Mary Tixera. Yeah, Brooklyn in the house, Brooklyn, Brooklyn in the, in the house. house. And, you know, just to add on to what you're saying about these multiple intelligences, you as you know, what you know, what the Brooklyn Library has recently done vis-a-vis -vis Jay Z. And we have had crowds for like four months. And 
And I'm telling you, the Brooklyn Library has has 20,000 new library cards. So if you can get people to read that way, why not? Why not get them to read that way? Uh, so it, it just sort of uh, underscores what you're what you're saying. So we have been um, debating behind the scenes, Congressman Bowman, uh, uh, about this next question. This is one of our uh, attendees. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. And uh, <laughs> and so you you choose to answer or not answer according to how you're feeling. Uh, okay. And she and she is a professor on campus. She's a communications professor who has done a a film called 1948, and it's about the Palestinian issue. Uh, she's shown this film all over the world. And she her question is: You have taken a principled, unwavering commitment to social justice for all, including Palestinians in Gaza. And although you suffered attempts to silence you and bribe you, you stood staunchly against the genocide, refusing erasure of Palestinians. Would you please address this and how we have come become complicit in the genocide and enabling it with our own tax money? You know, for me, it's simply about human rights um, and it's simply about our collective humanity. And, you know, I think we have been dishonest in our conversations as it relates to Israel, Palestine. You know, we've been talking about a two state solution as lip service, more so than putting the policies in place that would hold the Israeli government accountable and actually lead to the creation of a Palestinian state. And so I've been there, I've been to the West Bank, um, I wasn't even allowed to go to Gaza. That's how bad it is. But the West Bank is bad in and of itself. Um, you have a giant wall surrounding the West Bank. You have extreme poverty. You have um, uh, checkpoints that you that me as a member of Congress who who you know like you said votes to fund the Israeli government. Um, you know I couldn't go through those checkpoints. And so, you know, I think when we're having the conversation about human rights and international law, we have to have honest conversations and we have to hold uh, even our allies accountable when they are violating international law. And so I think the U.S. hasn't done a good enough job of that. The U.S. hasn't done a good enough job of holding uh, the Israeli government accountable. Uh, yes, we want them to be our allies. Absolutely, they have a right to de defend themselves and self-determination. The Palestinians have that same right too. And no, we don't want to see uh, any sort of extremism killing civilians. That is horrible and a war crime and violates international law. But that doesn't then make it okay to do what's happening now in Gaza as it relates to collective punishment and using white phosphorus and cutting off water and food and electricity and laying siege uh, to innocent civilians. Um, I think that harms our ability to get the hostages back that we want to get back. And I think it punishes everyone with the possibility that you might not even get all of Hamas. I also think it gives birth to more extremists going forward because I'm worried about how is the world gonna see the Israeli government after this, and I want to make a one very clear distinction, because I know these things are conflated all the time. The Israeli government is not representative of the Jewish people. Those are two, those are two different things. And so when I criticize the Israeli government, I'm not criticizing Jewish people. When I'm criticizing the Myanmar government, I'm not criticizing Buddhists. When I'm criticizing Saudi Arabia, I'm not criticizing Muslims. When I criticize the US, I'm criticizing the US government because our governments have to do better for its people as opposed to using our people and our trauma and our grief and our suffering for their own power. And so, you know, I, I think we have to have honest conversations about that and not be afraid to have these conversations because that's the only way we learn and grow and get to a place of peace for everyone, which is the goal, peace and justice for everyone. 
No dead children, no dead civilians, no senseless murder. And I'll close with this. You know, Dr. King warned us near the end of his life that America's three almost disease, genetic diseases are militarism, capitalism, and racism. All three of those are manifesting right now. Not just anti-Black racism, anti-Jewish racism, anti-Muslim racism, anti-other racism, as well as our militarism to solve every problem as opposed to d diplomacy, um, and, and as well as our capitalism. Because while we spend almost $900 billion a year on war, people can't afford rent and food and childcare and transportation. And we have an economic system where two Americans own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the country combined, 175 million people. So we just got to tell the truth. And we can't allow you know, the propaganda and the fear to stop us from, from achieving our full humanity, which I, which I, I think it... I think that's what God wants us to do. All right. Thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, I know that you were a bit limited on time. And um, from what I've been watching on Twitter, uh, I believe you may be uh, heading to the floor for a vote on a colleague. Yes, I am. <laughs> so, yes. Um, <laughs> I got to uh, change into my suit. I can't go on the floor like this. Yeah. So once again, thank you so much. We do really do appreciate thank you. you joining thank us. Thank you. Appreciate and, it, you, and you thank know, you. I, I have to say that you're truly a man of peace. And, and, and this has been just so wonderful to hear that come out of someone who has to face these terrible people. I don't know how you do it. There's a couple of us on this panel who were former cops. And mm -hmm. I'd much rather do that than do what you're doing because I, I don't know how you face these these awful people. But you know, you hang in there and know that Thank we have you. your back. Thank you so much. God bless you. Talk God soon. God bless you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.